Okay, it's great to see everybody here tonight, and so we're going to talk about solutions. But take us a, I'll, I'll first I'll frame how we're going to get there. It, it can take courage to live through these times with open eyes, and yet we really have no choice. However, as it turns out, if we, at, we can both broaden our gaze and sharpen our gaze, and by doing so, that will reveal to us solutions that often we didn't know existed and that remain under the radar, although I am happy to say these solutions are beginning to emerge, thanks in large part to groups like Biodiversity for a Livable Climate um, that helped sponsor this and does great work, um, especially around the Boston area. The theme tonight is how we look at things, how we see things. By this, oh. we'll help if you speak just a little more into that, if that's okay. Okay, sure, sure. There. Okay, yeah, that 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 resonates. Okay, let me feel that. That's good. <laughs> so the theme tonight is how we see things. By this, we mean seeing in the literal sense of what we take in visually. Tony Eprile, my husband and travel partner on many of my reporting trips, will speak specifically about this. He is a novelist, a teacher of writing, and a photographer, and he has written and he speaks about observation. And in speaking about observation, he often draws our attention to what we might miss, and that's really important. But in terms of how we see things, we also mean seeing as in to understand or apprehend. For the longer that I do this work, the more I've come to believe that it is the way that we comprehend and talk about our global challenges, including climate change, that interferes with our ability to do anything about them. And yet here we have opportunity for by asking the right questions and paying attention to how natural systems function, we can start to make a meaningful difference. Now, how do we see our challenges today? We'll start with climate. Climate is often talked about in terms of it being a carbon problem, with the notion that carbon itself is a problem, a pollutant. But the problem isn't carbon per se, is that there's too much of it in the air rather than in the ground. So um, this is a very well-traveled slide, but it gives you the point. Make soil end global warming. <coughs> By focusing only on emissions, we're just hearing half the story. The other is that due to the way that we've treated the land, our soils have lost valuable carbon. But through regenerative agricultural practices, we can bring it back. Doing so also allows us to take on other challenges as carbon in soil is key to fertility, soil biodiversity, and the land's ability to retain water, thus offering resilience in the face of floods and droughts. Now, I'm just gonna toss this out here. Have many of you heard about soil carbon? Does that sound like kind of an alien term? Okay, okay, so word is getting out. Okay, I will say that when I wrote my book, Cows Save the Planet, it came out in 2013, and I was doing all this reading and research about soil. I was sitting there at my desk in Bennington, Vermont, and Tony can attest to this, and I would say, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Oh my gosh, if, you, if farmers do this, and these people are getting these results, and there's, there, it's not flooding, whereas their neighbors are flooding, and it, it just, I was, but it was just me and my sources you know, kind of like, you know, my virtual connections. But now, um, there are so many organizations. Every week or so, I learn of a new group that is rallying around building the soil or some aspect of regenerative agriculture. Absolutely, we should do everything we can to reduce emissions. But it concerns me that the climate movement has zeroed in on this to the exclusion of other factors. You see, climate is way too multifaceted and complex to be a function of one sole metric. 
yet we've been trying to squeeze it into that single package by looking at climate more broadly, acknowledging its dynamism and complexity, we find opportunities to bolster the processes that regulate climate, which brings us to water. According to Australian microbiologist Walter Yenna, that's not him, <laughs> who Bio for Climate brought over to speak, and Walter will be back in the US this spring. I mean, Whenever people from Australia, when they, when they come to, to the U.S., I mean, they're really here. I mean, you can, I'm, you, I guarantee that you can call Walter and he'll say, okay, I'll, you know, because he's, he's going to be here for a while. I know that he'll be in Kansas and I'm sure, and, and in Vermont as well. But what Walter says is that water-based processes govern some 95% of the Earth's natural heat dynamics. Once we think about it, that makes perfect sense. However, when we talk about climate and water, the link usually goes in one direction. We talk about how climate change is going to put added stress on water resources throughout the world. Of course, that is a concern, but what is hopeful and exciting is the extent to which we can work with the water cycle to bolster nature's means of climate regulation. We often regard water as a noun, as something bounded by place. However, I've come to regard water as a verb. Water is always in motion. It expands in volume or retrenches. It retains or releases energy. It changes state, moving from gas to liquid to solid and back again in an ongoing dialogue with land, plants, and sun. This is not just to fuss over language, something that, as a writer, I'm prone to do. Rather, understanding how water works, how it moves across the landscape and through the atmosphere, can help us address some pretty large global problems, including climate change. So let's, for the moment, zero in on a few water processes. First, so we're thinking, okay, so we're seeing water, or we're seeing water now as a verb, instead of as a noun. Okay, first, infiltration. Alan Savory, who developed holistic management, says that rather than looking at the overall rainfall of a place, what's more important is to understand how much effective rainfall you have, how much of that water soaks into the ground so you have access to it. Okay, again, I'm going to open this up for a second. How many of you or have many of you heard of Alan Savory? Because if it would be helpful, we can give a little introduction. Okay, um, first let me just say that, that this is a river in Zimbabwe that now flows a full kilometer higher up into the landscape than it did, and that is because of holistic management, which is a program that he developed. Okay, so Alan Savory is a fellow, he's a wildlife biologist, maverick, rancher, thinker from Zimbabwe. He was there when it was Rhodesia, and he was actually quite involved in um, the changes in that country. And so he loved wildlife more than anything. And he's in he his- chief game range of the country, so that's a pretty high <laughs> position. In, yeah, in yeah. And um, so um, he's now in his 80s, so that gives you a sense of when he was a young man, he started to, to see that the wildlife wasn't as plentiful as he had remembered in his childhood. And he didn't know why this was. The thinking at the time, including in the, the you know, the, among the range, you know, the um, pro professionals, was that it was because there were too many animals. So they would fence off land so that, to keep the animals out. But when they kept the animals out, the land deteriorated. So if the, if the cause of the problem was that there were too many animals and yet the, the land was deteriorating without the animals, then something, something wasn't adding up. And he devoted a lot of time to observing and to posing the question, what's really going on here? In, in short, he, he came up with an understanding, a couple of basic understandings. One is that, is that 
grazing animals and grassland ecosystems, because this is in the African savanna, co-evolved so that the land needs the animals in the same way that the animals need the land. Also, that while land can suffer because there are, there's overgrazing, there's too much impact from animals, land can also suffer when there's not enough animal impact. So over time, he developed a, an approach to managing livestock so that the behavior, the actions of, these, of the animals mimic the dynamics of the movement of, of the wild herds of animals that they would have had. Because what had happened is that, you know, the dynamics had shifted because of the encroachment of human development, because of the loss of, lo of wild predators. And the predators were the key because the predators would keep the grazing animals on the move. So what happened was the, an the predator would make its presence known and then the grazing animals would bunch up and you know, trample the ground and that created a lot of impact. But it didn't, and they were also they were grazing and nibbling on the plants in a way that stimulated the growth of the grasses. They were pressing in, um, seeds, they were pressing in the decaying grasses so that microorganisms could work upon them and, and, and their waste fertilized the soil and all of that organic matter was, was incorporated into the soil. So that's, that's really the process that built the great grasslands of the world. Can I add Please. To that? Oh, so I'll come stand here for a second. So um, one of the observations Alan Savory made is he was reading accounts of the early travelers in southern Africa. And these accounts describe these vast herds of um, ungulates of, of uh, impala and springbok and wildebeest and buffalo. Huge numbers, like you, can, you can't even get through them. They're just traveling through the land. And at the same time, they're describing how there's grass that's so high, even on a horse, you have, you have trouble seeing over the grass. And he's going, well, how is that possible if animals are a problem? And I think one of the observations he wound up making is that you have really three types of, of major grasses. You have um, animal-dependent grasses that need the animal distribution and the feeding on it. You have rest-dependent grasses that need times when the land is fallow. And you have fire-dependent grasses. And more and more in the dry lands of the world, we've moved to fire-dependent grasses primarily. So that's... Yeah, yeah and, and that's significant because in nature, an organism will tend to promote the conditions under which it would thrive. So these are, these are all dynamics. And I know that you were really struck. Okay, I, I don't know I if I've made... Sure oh, okay, okay, I won't, I won't do that. Anyway, um, Tony and I got to spend a full eight days with Alan Savory and his wife, Jody Butterfield, at the Africa Center for Holistic Management in Zimbabwe. And it was really, really extraordinary to see the tremendous changes that had occurred there because they documented, they would show, this is what this land looked like in 1995, and this is what it looks like now, um, and um, to also to see how he engages in such a profound way with the land around him, to, to, to be able to see, to look at land through the eyes of someone with that much knowledge and, and keenness of observation was really, really powerful. So, um, so this is the Dimbengombe River, which you know now flows further and also it, it now flows throughout the year and that's significant for many reasons that a lot of um, water attracted wildlife had returned to the area and I like elephants so I like to think of how it's much easier now for the elephants because when, when the water wasn't flowing as well the elephants would have to um, in, the, in the dry season walk a great distance to the only permanent pool in the area, but now they have many areas to water and to wallow and, and bathe, and they like to bathe in mud and play. And those are, um, that's the cattle that we saw when we got up 
early one morning to um, see them being moved into where they're going to be for that day. And I can tell you that it's so hot and, and dry heat in Zimbabwe that that's a cool moment of the day. And even then, you can just feel that, that sun is just revving up to, you know, beam down with a vengeance. So, um, you know, so that was from, because the land, because they, Alan's philosophy is to ensure that all the rain that falls on the landscape is effective rainfall, so that all of, the, all of the rain stays in the system that enhances infiltration. And it is really hard to overstate just how important water infiltration is. I mean, it sounds kind of technical, you know, water infiltration, but really, in, in, when we were in Zimbabwe, we had the chance to visit some villages where the communities are working with the Africa Center. So in one village called Sienyanga, which is way off a dirt road, a long dirt road um, near the Wangi uh, National Park, um, long, dusty road. So this community, because they were using managed animal impact on their fields, that meant that they had more soil organic matter, which meant better water infiltration. Okay? So, sounds good, <laughs> so far so good. What this meant for this community is that they were able to keep water on the land and grow crops for seven months out of the year instead of only two months out of the year, which is what would happen when the soil wasn't holding the water and the you know rain, rains, they'd get rain, heavy rains during the rainy season and the water would just flow off and carry away all the nutrients. So because they were able to grow, extend their growing season, they were able to get off international food aid, which is a huge, huge thing, and they were so proud. So that uh, really meaningful. Um, I've been talking to people lately in the permaculture community, like the global <laughs> permaculture movement, and some of the people that I've, um, you know, I'm in ongoing touch with have worked to restore degraded lands in places like Yemen, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, and here is their definition of a desert, a place where it floods whenever it rains because there's no capacity for the water to infiltrate. But we know that this state isn't inevitable or necessarily permanent. Once the land has the capacity to do so, to hold that water, it ceases to be a desert. So now we're moving into another, another water process, transpiration. I interviewed a fellow named Antonio Nobre, author of a report called The Future Climate of Amazonia. The Amazon rainforest has about four billion trees. Together, these trees act like geysers and spout a river of vapor in the air, an aerial river through which flows five times as much water as the Amazon River itself. This flying river is the result of transpiration, the upward movement of water through plants. You can think of it as the plants sweating. The stomata on the leaves, or if you've got grass on the, on the blades, open to retain or release moisture to cool the plant itself and the nearby <coughs> vicinity of the soil. What's important is that this is a cooling mechanism, transforming solar heat into latent heat suspended in the water vapor, as opposed to sensible heat, or heat you can feel, like a hot sidewalk. According to Czech botanist Jan Pokorny, the transpiration activity of one tree on one sunny day represents three times the cooling capacity of a large air conditioner in a five-star hotel. This is huge if it's a, been a scarcely noticed up till now, climate opportunity. If you think about all the degraded land across the world, and it's a lot, I mean something like, you know, 25% of the world's land right now is 
moderately or se severely desertified. I mean, this is a lot of land that is underperforming. Um, if you think about all the land around the world that is now absorbing heat, that, with a change in management, could regain its temperature regulating capacity, that's kind of a pretty significant opportunity. All right, now condensation. This is the process of water vapor turning back to liquid. It's like transpiration's meteorological mirror. Condensation is also a source of water, and I include this, I think it's just really good to think about all, what opportunities all these diff different processes present. I write about a couple in far west Texas who designed their rain barn to collect condensation. They didn't realize just how much water they actually were capturing until the winter morning, four months since the last rain, when the water tank overflowed. Okay, that's, that's the water tank, that's, that's Marcus. And um, Tony's gonna talk a little bit more about Marcus because he really impressed, he really impressed Tony. Do you wanna say anything well, about him now? Yeah, because yeah. I actually don't have a slide of this, okay. but one of the wonderful things, Marcus um, is someone who really looks at the world around him and um, basically he, he came up with this idea in part just looking at how you get dew in the morning, and well, what can we, what can we do with that uh, condensation? We do the dew, yeah. Um, and one of the ways that he built this incredible rain barn is he um, read, he'd heard about the Nama beetle, which is a beetle in the uh, deserts of Namibia, and the only source of water that this beetle has is the change in temperature. And so at sunrise, it stands in a particular, with its carapace at a particular angle that um, is just right for getting the heating and the, the wind flow under its long legs so that there's a different differential temperature and droplets of water form on its back and run down into its mouth. And he you built the rain barn roof at the same angle that he had discovered is the case of the Nama beetle. Uh, he also recognized that if you raise the roof just a little bit, you've got more airflow underneath, so you've got more temperature differential. So where other people's roofs were not uh, getting... Yeah, I'm sorry. So where other people's um, roofs were not... I should go down a bit. Uh, were not um, having as much condensation, he was maximizing that. So he was using observation to... Uh, really improved the amount of water they had, and also not just relying on wells, because everyone had wells, so that was the, the thought. This is how you get water, you dig a well. He's like, well, let's get water at some other ways. Yeah, it was really interesting, just the level of design that they had, that they, that, like, the points where the pipes, like, leaked a little, like, where, you know, water went from one pipe to another, that's where the bees went, and the you know, and then the, there would be a little bit of dropping into a pail. That's where the chickens went, and then there, um, when they grew a few crops, I mean, just you know, really you know, more garden plants, they situated them so that they were shaded as long into the morning as they could be, to, so that they had a longer period of dew. So. Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. And then another, another fan of dew I'll introduce you to. Um, this is the vertigo-inducing <laughs> view of um, Kachana Station. This is um, a, a fellow that I wrote about in Australia. He manages, Chris, his name is Chris Hengler. He manages a tract of land which is the size of the five boroughs of New York City. Um, he doesn't own it. In Australia, they have 99-year leases. So, but, so he manages his, this land, and his product is restored land. And he thinks of himself as a, an environmental capitalist, meaning that you know, what people call, you know, people who consider themselves capitalists maximizing return and profit, but they might be demeaning the resource. He said, well, that's not being a good, you know, an effective capitalist. I want to build the resource. Um, so he says that he pays as much attention to do as other, to other sources of water as it supports a healthy ecosystem and microclimate. 
He says there are all those additional microorganisms that can keep active throughout extended periods well after the rainy season, as long as they get a watering each night. In a, in a living system, moisture generates more moisture, he says, of which dew is one manifestation. Okay. Now, I'm going to turn it over. Thanks. Um, yeah, let's give your hand first. <laughs> Um, so, um, I'm going to talk about this in one moment. The, um, one of my favorite examples of creative seeing is a story my brother-in-law told me some years ago. He was friends with a, um, a neurologist who worked a lot with brain-damaged patients, many of whom had been in motorcycle accidents. And this neurologist was walking in the woods one day when he heard a woodpecker. And instead of doing what most of us do, just go, oh, that's interesting, a woodpecker, he stopped and he thought, well, this is very strange. This bird is banging its head against a tree at an incredibly high rate. Uh, why isn't the woods filled with dead and dazed woodpeckers? And he began studying the, uh, the woodpecker skull and the way that the woodpeckers um, how they, how they peck and how there's no lateral movement when they peck uh, at the bark. And he discovered a number of things. Um, there are a whole bunch of reasons why woodpeckers don't kill themselves, you know, doing that rat-tat beak, beak against the, the hard surface of the wood, uh, including having a tongue that's a very absorptive, having a very tightly encased uh, cranium holding the brain in. And he wound up designing a much better motorcycle helmet as a result. So, but wh what's happening here for me is, is here's someone who is not doing what might be called recognizing. Um, the person who first really discussed this is a, a Russian formalist critic named Viktor Shklovsky. And um, he came up with something called Ostranenyi, Making Strange which is that we can be creative by looking at something familiar and withdrawing our understanding of it in such a way that it becomes a strange object. This water jug becomes something not just purposeful, but we're looking at it as it is, as much as possible. And he discusses the difference between recognition and seeing. Recognition is we know what something is and what it's doing, and therefore, that's all we see when we look at it. And most of us do recognition most of the time, and it's very important. You couldn't drive uh, with any kind of facility if you didn't recognize, if you didn't slow down when you see taillights go on, if all you were doing was seeing everything as if it's brand new for the first time. But it, you also need that process for creativity and creative thinking. Um, so a couple of ways of just our Recognition fools us. Okay. Do, what do people think this is? Mountain. Mountain. You've seen this? Have you seen this before? Or? Good eyes there. Yep. We have a cow. And we have the cow. And once you see the cow, I mean, it's a very standard visual trick. Once you see the cow, it's really hard to unsee it. Um, but so often we don't see the cow because we're thinking, oh, that's the landscape. We're used to maps or we're used to looking in a, in a certain way. And this is where I love so many of the kind of maverick scientists that Judy's been interviewing and meeting is they're looking at things and going, hmm, we've been told Animals are bad for the landscape, but that's not what I see going on. That's not what I see in front of me. Um, a couple more fun things of this kind. Okay. Um, this is not a cow. Did anyone guess what this is? <laughs> it's a nose. Sorry? Now you start wondering what, you know, is it this is, this is a photograph I took of a beaver pond from above. Um, what I like about this kind of photography is it's hard to tell the size, the perspective. Uh, this could be a much larger landscape or 
a very small landscape, it can be hard to tell that. Can you rearrange the letters here to make one word? Yep, <laughs> we already did that. <laughs> so often people are used to making, you know, doing the acrostics and trying to figure out, uh, you know, Renaudo, Woodner, what is this? Yeah, it makes one word. Um, this is a famous photograph that caused quite a stir when it first showed uh, Joel Sternfeld, a photographer, um, McLean, Virginia. And anyone want to just say what's going on in this picture? Take a moment to. A house is burning down. A house is burning down. <laughs> well, anything else catch your eyes? You're a very good observer. <laughs> um, yeah, many people were really upset because um, you see a fireman buying pumpkins. And they were like, why is a fireman wasting time buying pumpkins when the house is burning down? Well, it's a training exercise for firemen, and so there's no urgency. They're, they're doing their training exercise. He doesn't need to be there. He's buying pumpkins for Halloween. But there was a huge objection at the time this photograph ran in Life magazine. It's like, look what's happening to our tax money. The fireman is out buying pumpkins. Um, and this is my last slide just for for. Fun. This is um, a grass seed from a place very, that I, I've gone to for a long time, very beloved place that had burned down in a, in a tremendous wildfire. And I was visiting the place a few years later. They'd rebuilt the cabins in the area I'd gone to. And I kept finding these seeds everywhere. And I'd never seen these seeds before. And it's something called fillery. And what's fascinating about these seeds, they're actually kind of about this long, they're maybe an inch long, they're tiny. Um, if they get wet, they start spiraling, and they dig into the ground. And the seed, you can see that little um, like arrowhead uh, quality to the seed, and it, um, it's an amazing thing. It's a fire-adaptive seed. And it lasts for a long time. It's, it needs fire to exist. And it, uh, as soon as there's some rain, it, it burrows. And then you have more fire-dependent grass. And one of the things about fire-dependent grass is that um, it grows pretty quickly. And then you have a lot of grass that then oxidizes very rapidly. And then it burns. And it needs bare ground. And it needs bare ground because otherwise, yeah, this is a note. When I've gone back there, you don't see them any, these seeds anymore because other plants have sprung up in the wake of those seeds and eventually taken over. But it needs bare ground. It needs drought. Um, it's uh, one of the things, Judy and I were in California in uh, May of last year. And they just, Northern California, they just had 100 inches of rain, amazing amount of rain. The whole place was green. Everyone was so happy it was green, except the environmentalists we knew who were all saying, what is going to happen in fire season? And we have just seen what happened in fire season. So this comes back again to the, the processes by which we can actually address climate problems, one of which is to really have, uh, we can now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, um, had, had all that water been or more of that water been held on the landscape, it would have been a very different scenario. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, one, I guess, I guess one thing that, um, in terms of, you know, recognition versus ob observing, I think that often we get kind of stuck in what cause and effect are. So, just as an example with climate, okay, so we look at a desert, like a, a photo of a desertified landscape, you know, like a picture of, um, you know, some place in Africa where, you know, nothing is growing and you might see like the skull of a, you know, dead animal, you know, that shows just how dramatic it is. And often that's presented as this is 
climate change. This is what, you know, is the, the result of climate change. But what isn't said is that this is a cause of climate change because right. all that bare ground means that the soil is oxidizing, losing carbon, so that's more CO2 in the atmosphere, and the water isn't being held on the land, and there aren't plants growing that could be transpiring and cooling and creating more microclimate so that we get secession, which is you know towards greater sophistication in the plant communities. So that's important to know because we can do something about that. So the more that we understand that we can do what we what we can do something about. Um, yeah, that's an example. Yeah. yeah. Well, this I'm almost done on this, so we can um, share. But one example again, when we were in New Mexico, uh, where we saw the rain barn, um, we went Texas. to Texas. Sorry, New Mexico later. Um, we went to Big Bend National Park, and I was reading the uh, ranger's guide to Big Bend, and it mentioned that they get an annual rainfall of around 11 inches a year. Being from Southern Africa, I was like, that's actually a lot of rain. That's a lot more rain than many of the places I, I've known, and yet it's a desert. And so one question is, well, what's going on that it's, it's a desert? Um, a lot has to do with how quickly the rain falls and what happens to it, and that there's the fact that you don't have the grazing animals that would allow for the, the soil to be absorbent in the way that uh, we see in, um, in the holistic land managed um, land, the, the African, Africa Center, where when the rain comes, it instead of washing away the topsoil, it is absorbed into several inches of soil and stays there and creates new growth. So these are... Yeah, so, so I know people in California that are working on grazing now to manage the fire fuel because what happened when all that growth happened, you know, all that green growth, you know, how are you going to manage all that plant matter? Um, yeah, so um, people are beginning to, beginning to do that. And one thing that I will say about, about the California fires is... Okay, so the, where, when I began this, um, I said that it can take courage to live in these times with open eyes. I have been so impressed by people's responses, people in the grazing community and you know, different aspects of the environmental community in, in California, how maybe, you know, I know one fellow that basically lost um, all, the, you know, all his land burned. You know, he was able to save his animals, but you know, the land burned. So these people basically are taking like maybe 24, 48, 48 hours to feel sorry for themselves, but then they are up and and you know saying, what can we do better? What different approaches? How can we work together? And people are really, really active and sharing and asking really important questions about how to hydrate their landscape, how to better manage the fire fuel. There are, just, there are a number of gatherings that are happening where people are sharing information and knowledge and understanding. And anyway, that to me is very exciting. I'm hearing people saying, how can we rebuild our landscape so that it is more resilient and more functional. So. Do we want to open up for questions? Or yes. Um, Very. Oh, yeah. yeah we, we can, can both stand up. Oh, okay. I guess probably easiest because people can in hear us. Ah, okay. So, um, so, so basically, when you have a lot of growth, and then it, it, during a rainy season, and then you get you know, a period of more dryness, and then the plants dry out, and they're very flammable. So, so what happens? Okay, so, so one thing that Alan Savory talks about is, he talks a lot about the process of decay. You know, we've got the life cycle, 
and you know, uh, there's a lot of um, biological activity that goes into breaking down materials and reincorporating them to keep the life cycle going. So he talks about how if you just leave grasses out, they are going to break down and oxidize, but that's chemical. You know, it kind of, it's, it, breaks into its various elements and goes into the air and maybe some, you know, mineral residue. Oh, okay, but anyway, he talks about, oh, oh I'll, just, I'll just finish this, that, um, but when, you're, when you have animals managing the land, that's, that's biological, and, and fire is chemical breaking down of, of materials, so, the cost when it's done, when, it break, when the plant material breaks down chemically through fire or oxidation, and fire is a form of oxidation, then you get CO2 in the atmosphere, you get other pollutants. But when it's done biologically, it's kind of in a closed circle. Anyway, sorry. And just to add to that, um, again, this is where the, the recognition and closed thinking starts to happen, is when you talk to most people about climate change, they say we need to find a technological solution. And what's being talked about um, here is the, a biological solution, recognizing that biology is what is, that climate change is connected to biology, is connected to the loss of biodiversity, and that the best ways to address that is through recognizing the biology. And we keep thinking chemicals are going to to help us solve this. Um, Technology is going to help us solve this, but really it's so vital to, to keep in mind particularly the biology. Is the well, in terms of the way we see things, the way that our public discussions have been, have evolved, climate tends to be driven by physics. Biology has been left out. Um, Agricultural science has been driven by chemistry. Biology has been ignored, but biology is rearing its head. <laughs> um, you know, we're having a lot of, you know, like super weeds, for example. You know, like you can't do, apply chem, you can't merely act on a basis of chemical intervention without having biological consequences. And Geology, or no, soil science has been driven by geology, and that's why often people say that it takes 500 years to build an inch of topsoil, but that's only talking about the weathering of minerals. When you bring biology into the picture, you can build topsoil very, very rapidly. So anyway, it's how we see it. Um, that's a very good question, and I've also I lived a long time in Southern California, and um, I don't think anyone's saying the solution is an easy one. For one thing, the reason why you all you're seeing it as clay there now is also historical because of our impact on that land. So you're right, it's there, and how do we uh, resolve this? Um, we don't have the pictures from uh, the uh, Africa Center, but uh, Alan has pictures of this absolutely dead, dry land that's um, basically pretty much uh, the soil is dead and it's hard as rock. And what they did is they brought in they brought in some plant matter and they brought in animals uh, for a limited amount of time to this area, took them away again, let it rest, and the next rainfall there was a little bit of growth. 
And they did this again very carefully because it doesn't, you, it's a lot of it is a process of thinking. And you look at that land now and it's unbelievable because it, it's tall grasses. But it started with that exactly what you're saying. Um, and it's hard, it it's, takes a lot of work, it's hard to do, but it, it's not insoluble. I hope, I hope that helps. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, there are a lot of different ways. Um, so in the permaculture realm, there are a lot of um, ways of um, kind of angling, going into the subsoil, so you capture water on contours. There are all, the, there are all these approaches. I'm just thinking um, there are some great, great little videos you can check. I don't know if any of you have heard of Jeff Lawton. He's Jeff with a G. <laughs> He's an Australian guy who had a project of greening the desert in Jordan and takes you step by step. And it's actually really interesting that, you know, I know someone who saw that video and decided I'm going to do this work. And now he's one of the fellows I mentioned that has been in Yemen and Syria and, you know, all these places and just goes in. Um, there's also, I don't know if you've heard of um, a fellow named John D. Liu, because um, I know that um, he spoke, in, I guess, in Cambridge a couple years ago. So he does a lot of work. Um, he's a filmmaker documenting ecological restoration. And there's, um, what got him interested in this is at, he's um, Chinese American and he was visiting his grandmother in China and found himself in China in the late 70s, just as things were really changing, so he stayed there, and he helped to open the first big, you know, international news bureau there, and ended up working for CBS, covering all these geopolitical changes, and in 1995, he was asked to document the restoration of the Los Plateau, which is an area of land about the size of Belgium, and there were people there, this, this had been the breadbasket of China. This is where agriculture began 10,000 years ago in China, and all of the, the soil was just spent. I mean, there was nothing left. He, he showed, there, you see pictures of like a goat, you know, up on a hill, you know, nibbling the last bit of grass. And the Chinese government said, okay, you know, we can either support these tens of millions of people in perpetuity, giving them charity because they, we have to help them survive, or maybe we can fix the land, restore the land. So John documented that over time, and they got people, the villagers involved and paid vi the people in the villages to um, help terrace the land and plant trees and plant different kinds of vegetation, and you just see the green sweep into this landscape, and you know, millions of people got, you know, emerged from poverty, from from this, so that's an, there are so many examples of horrible, you know, like devastating landscapes that have been brought back. There's a really interesting uh, project in um, Portugal, Tamara, um, where they took degraded land and they created um, a water retention landscape. So there are lots of ways, and lots of different ways into the inquiry of what's going to work there. You might ask, well, you know, what was this land when it was flourishing? What does this land want to be? And what conditions created that? I mean, one thing in California is that there were be a lot of beaver, certainly in Northern California. I don't know how far south they went, but th the activity of the beaver kept the landscape hydrated because they were, their dams were holding and slowing down the water. So, yeah, th there are a lot of, a lot of ways in. And just to add about the beaver, I don't know how many of you have seen the George Monbiot um, film about the reintroduction of wolves to uh, Yellowstone and how that brought the beaver back, which changed the, the way the rivers run and the landscape. Um, and so we know someone has a project to kind of reintroduce beaver all over California, although a lot of ranchers and farmers don't like that idea. But it's a really interesting, important yes, um, um. Oh, Amelia?
Yeah, that, that in many ways, the, the, digest, the digestive system of the animal is the crucible for all these dynamics. It's worth remembering that the North America had megafauna, um, you know, some, what is it, 10,000 years ago, maybe a little more recently than that, and that, that has disappeared, so we've lost that method of, of working the landscape, which doesn't mean we can't try to bring that back to some extent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Within our small um, university, how, how do you, do? you can, I can um, Well, I can answer one part of that, which is that um, a very direct, simple, immediate way to do this is to absolutely not use chemical fertilizers and not use, you know, not have those lawns that have the, the um, weed killers. Um, to discourage if you're in a housing complex to say, please don't do this. Um, and the reason for this is that at first it's killing the soil, but those fertilizers are washing into the ocean and have changed the ocean. And 50% of our oxygen in the world comes from um, bacteria on the surface of the ocean. And there, it's been much reduced, that bacteria, because of the, the warming and acidification of the oceans. So that's one thing. Another would be, um, Judy has yeah, quite a few, um, buying uh, produce that's grown um, with these regenerative, restorative um, methods, encouraging your local lawmakers to uh, enact laws that, that en encourage and offer maybe tax breaks for farmers who are doing restorative grazing instead of um, what we're going to call reductive grazing or reductive animal management products. So these are just some of the, I mean, I think we can do it on the personal level and the political level. And uh, I, go ahead. Oh, and it goes beyond, you know, the food that you buy. I mean, because there's a growing movement of regenerative clothing now, too. So you can actually buy clothing. There's the first product that's now out and available to the general public. It's a, it's a little hat, a little beanie hat um, from the North Face that's made of climate beneficial wool um, because the, the animals, are the sheep are managed in a way that is restoring the landscape. We know a sheep farmer and we buy from his restorative, his regenerative CSA. But don't underestimate the value of knowing what is possible. Because once you do, you know, start to think in terms of what, it, what are the effects on the landscape, what, you know, what products can I buy, or what, or how to, when people talk about different challenges, it shifts your perspective. It really does. I mean, I often talk about it, how soil, for many, is kind of the gateway drug to you know climate activism and you know getting involved in regenerative agriculture. So 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 that's that's part of it. And continue to have nature be in your life. And it depends how ambitious you are. You'd be amazed at what people are able to produce in terms of food on very small bits of land. There's a book out called Paradise Lot about how. Um, through using permaculture and, you know, integrating trees and, and um, food producing, you know, other plants, what they can produce, and I, I think it was like an eighth of an acre or something like that. And, and even uh, there's a fellow in, in um, Arizona that um, does rainwater harvesting and has this food forest. I know people in Brooklyn that have, a food, that have food forests. Also, even the restaurants you go to, if they're ones that are, are buying from local farmers, if they're buying from farmers practicing restoration, if they're buying grass-fed, range-fed beef. Grass-fed, unfortunately, is one of those terms that, that covers a huge range of, of uh, ways that the animals are raised. But um, these are just some ways that, you know, we're all, whether we want to be or not consumers, that our consumption can be more, uh, less destructive, more regenerative. 
Yeah, and, and gathering with other people. Um, the, there's an organization called Regeneration International, and on their website they have uh, an article, How to Start a Regenerative, you know, a rege ge Regeneration Movement in Your Own Community. And another way I just thought of is, um, you know, to keep, keep up to date on kind of what, you know, what activism is going on. And there is a global soil, okay, there's a, um, I don't know if many of you have heard of the four per 1,000 initiative. So this is actually an international agreement that signatories pledge to improve the carbon in their soil, um, a, this very small but meaningful percentage every year for five years, 42 countries have signed on and individuals can sign on. You could decide to take a schoolyard and focus energy for the community to build the carbon in the soil on that land. That could be an educational, meaningful you know, um, way of people working together and you could be a signatory to this global agreement. So there are lots of ways. Yes? Oh, are we, are we need, you're watching the time? Or? Oh, okay. Just, um, I'm curious how you think, I mean, there's a number of people in this room who have been involved in climate change work, stopping pipelines, stopping the emission side. And if you think we're at, you know, 410 parts per million in carbon and stuff like that, when you, I'm just curious how, you, when you think about the role of enlarging these carbon sinks or regenerative agriculture, you know, have you ever just done your, your rough math so what does it take to actually, what would it take to move back to 300? What kinds of, like what scale of agricultural change? Okay. Um, you know, where, you know, can you sort of see the pressure points that would actually change the, the map? If you will? Yeah, I've, I've, heard an, I've heard a number of different figures and a number of different estimates. What I will say is that most estimates of the capacity to store for storing carbon, drawing down carbon into the ground, you know, from the atmosphere, they're really, really low for several reasons. One is that they don't, that they only are considering like the first, you know, maybe 10, 20 centimeters of land, whereas the real action, the carbon that counts, goes way down. I mean, you can really draw down a lot of carbon. Also, they're using estimates based on. Um, land that isn't particularly functional to begin with. Plus, there are a lot of innovations that are coming to the fore now. Um, there's a fellow, oh, he spoke at the, um, um, the recent Bio for Climate um, conference named David C. Johnson, and I think, so, so he's getting like 17 times the drawdown of carbon compared to what's typically looked at. Am I, do I have that right? It's like 10 times something? Nine or 10, but that's really, really significant. And he says that, um, that like maybe 20% of the world's agricultural lands, if 20% of the land changed to that kind of management, something, I mean, something very, very doable. The other thing is that there are all these co-benefits. So it's not just the carbon per se, it's that when you have living plants, you have the transpiration cooling, you have the, the shade that it's producing, and there are a lot of plants that grow better with intermittent shade. Um, you know, there are all these other things happening. So um, I'll, I'll share with you how I choose to look at climate change, okay? Because I think it's useful, okay. So um, whereas often we look at it simply as global warming from too much CO2 in the atmosphere because of the burning of fossil fuels, which is a, part, a big part of it, if we think about climate change as manifestations of distorted carbon, water, and energy cycles, that opens it up because there's a lot we can do. Because if we're only looking at the CO2 from co fossil fuels, then y yes, you know, protesting pipelines is really important, but we're, li we're constrained into how we can move towards significant solutions, if that makes 
like to move beyond stopping doing bad things to promoting you know positive healing measures it's also so important to not just look at the carbon figures because the real issue of climate change is also the loss of biodiversity and that effect on on the landscape generally including the the fact that 40% of our of the world's land is now brittle desertified landscape um, and just an example of some positive changes, Judy and I visited a ranch in uh, Chihuahua, Mexico, where uh, they were using um, holistic land management practices and had restored uh, a lot of the grassland there. And the result of that is all these birds were nesting. And it turns out that, what is it, 90% of the Midwest's uh, grass-eating birds and songbirds migrate to Chihuahua every year. Right, the Chihuahua Desert grasslands. The, the Chihuahua Desert, and that, those grasslands are disappearing, which means there's been a dramatic drop in the, uh, the bird population in, in the Midwest. And that has tremendous effect on, on seed distribution, on insect eating, and all these things. And they've created a, a corridor of grasslands that has made a big difference in trying to save these, these bird populations because otherwise, I mean, things are going to accelerate a great deal faster when you start having these kinds of, of uh, biological crashes. We, we worry about this with bees, obviously, uh, pollinators. So there are all kinds of huge, you know, contingent benefits to, to this kind of thinking. And, and well, that's crashes. another thing that, that um, people can do is to have plants that attract pollinators. And you can do that with very little space. So anyway, I'm sorry, there's a you've, been, you can you've do. been trying to ask questions. I'm sorry. No. I just wanted to say that uh, going forward, this, the current administration notwithstanding, there is this huge opportunity uh, for appropriate government efforts to harness this enormous amount of money in industry. That, and these are industries, some of which are responsible for part of the problem, and they could be a huge resource for the solution. Uh, so do you see anything uh, on the horizon, uh, perhaps before and after this administration, such that uh, these companies could be encouraged to diversify into um, industries that will save the planet? And just as, as a quick comment, I live just a few blocks from here in a larger condo complex. I'm on the garden level, so I'm four feet into the ground. I like a cool place. I do not need an air conditioner. I have geothermal cooling and always use a blanket at night, even if it's 95 degrees during the day. So, so just something that simple. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Plus, I have Petey the centipede. He works for me. He's okay. a, a higher level carnivore. He only he and a couple of friends come once in a while. They eat only live food, so I don't disturb him. You know, so I have mm -hmm. a natural, you know, anti bug, <laughs> bug yeah. you know, mm -hmm. gatherer. Yeah. I don't know. So excellent. Is there any oh. For oh um, um, uh, industry, yes, a lot of companies you would be surprised. And this is a very quiet movement at this point, maybe because of the political context, but a lot of businesses are, well, they're realizing that it's not good for them to keep going in the same direction. The, the regenerative food, personal pro care products, um, supplements, and clothing, leather, it's happening. And I think. Part of this, and this is a harder political one, is to try and start to get more and more of these companies and places to, to be um, paying for the actual cost of what they do. Uh, you raised that point, but, but the public supports the contingency costs of, of these giant CAFOs when they pollute the rivers and, and, and damage our climate. And the public pays for the fact that, what were there, 800 homes and in um, su Southern California built in a fire corridor where they, people knew if there's a big fire, the fire's coming right down this corridor. But those homes were built there anyway, and they've been destroyed, and, and the insurance companies and our insurance costs are what's gonna pay for that. 
So it's one thing is as a, just as concerned aware citizens is really trying to start pushing for, um, you know, these costs should not be outsourced to us. They, you're making the money off it, you have to pay to help prevent these, these issues. So, and good luck with it too. Oh, okay. There we go. Oh gosh, this is a, this is a this is a long question. And, and yeah. What, what um, I was coming up with is that there are some things in this world that don't have a cookie cutter. That's yeah. That's. And, 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 and my gosh, sometimes you have to go just this far, a year, reevaluate what's working, what's not, and tweak it. Yeah. You know that I don't know. If this was so infuriating. This Sierra Club. Takedown of Alan Savory, and they. I'm going to be writing back on this one. I'm mad at this. Okay, yeah, many oh, people are. Please, please write in because, you know, as a journalist, I will say that. Um, it's, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. What got me really angry is that the, the guy that was doing the takedown went to talk to Alan, but he didn't go to look at any land. How can you write about, you know, I'm going to write the you know, have the last word on this process that many people say works, some people say doesn't work, and not actually observe. We're back to observation. Yeah. It was just that, you know, there are two, a couple of peer reviews. Uh, uh, don't, really, I don't want to go down this road right, right I'll, now. I'll say the best proof, the best proof of it is that it's working. And so um, the some of the takedowns by people in the agricultural world particularly have been, well, we tried it and it didn't work. It's like, well, you didn't get the training and you didn't try it in the right way. Here's how it works. Here's where it's working. So let's look at where it is working. And, and just to give an example of how crazy this is, is our friend in Mexico, uh, his rancher neighbors are convinced that he gets more rainfall than they do and that's why. <laughs> That's why his land has more grass. Uh, I have just one uh, little glimmer about this, 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 this article. There was one comment that had me somewhat convinced. They were saying that when you have a bunch of cows, cattle, you know, kind of grinding into the ground, not talking about what's coming out of their back end, though, um, it, it, it clamps down in the ground and makes it too hard. And that somehow was convincing, mm -hmm. oh. as opposed to a big house around for a bit. Right. It, it, it all depends on the management. The point is that you keep them moving so that it breaks up the soil. Yeah, this, it, it, yeah, yeah. And it's all management and all observation and mm -hmm. checking to see, is this process good, you know, effective? Or have the animals been on long enough and I should move them now to get the, to the thank you, the desired result? And also just to, just to add to that, um, one of the points Alan makes, and, and he, that's why they teach a whole uh, way of doing this, is that it doesn't, it's not one size fits all. You really have to look at, at the actual landscape. So, it's not just that you're moving the cattle around, but maybe 
when is a good time for the cattle to be on this piece of land instead of that piece of land? Is there a time you can have it on longer or shorter? It requires a lot of adjusting and, and really close observation and smart thinking. It's not, it's not just, um, okay, you know, one week here, one week there, one week there, that's going to work. There is, there, you, you also have to look at the landscape. It goes back to the same question about, it's going to be different from degraded topsoil than clay. It's just going to be a different system process. And um, yeah. yeah. It, it's a little bit of a clash of paradigms because I think that a lot of people are saying, I want to know what the system is and we tried it, we want to put it into this frame that it can be done X, Y, Z and it would be this, you know, get such a result and if it doesn't, well clearly it doesn't work versus this is an emergent scenario that we're, um, you know, that it's, it has to be, we have to look at holistic, ongoing dynamics and need to respond in time. Um, it, it seems to me that, you know, the kinds of things you're talking about are easier when there's more rainfall. I don't know if that's a fair conclusion, but I think you're living in Vermont, is that right? Mm -hmm. So what could Vermont be doing better? It's mostly second growth forest with a lot of pasture, which is what everyone likes about the landscape. Uh, you know, and uh, Walmart here and there and, and, and so forth, but could more be done uh, in Vermont with you know, the resources that are there. The one, the one Abs absolutely. Um, Lake Champlain um, has been suffering from a lot of pollution. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm glad to say that a colleague that was up there recently said that in the last few years, he's seen a lot more cover over the land. So if you have if you, have, um, if you have bare soil and then you have farm activity and that, then the pollutants, the nitrogen, the fertilizers are all going to wash into the phosphorus, all going to wash into the water. But if you have plant cover, you're going to stabilize the soil, enrich the soil, have more carbon in the soil, so it's more filtered, the water stays in and, and the you know, it, all the pollutants are filtered out and, you know, I mean, a lot of these things, they're called pollutants because there's too much of it. If there's a little, you, you know, the phosphorus or the nitrogen isn't a problem per se, it's the quantity and the movement of it into the water. Um, also, we, we visited this local farm quite a bit where they're doing restorative grazing and one of the fascinating things about this is the variety of bird life there has dramatically improved. Uh, just in terms of both numbers and types of birds. There are more foxes on the land, there, and there are lots of good sort of side benefits. Um, foxes are actually really good at keeping down the mice that, that feed the ticks that give you <laughs> all these nasty diseases. So, so Vermont has, a, they have a bill now for, um, they're trying to work on for encouraging regenerative agricultural processes. Yeah, there's a very active health Vermont Healthy Soil Coalition. There's a lot of good stuff happening. We're on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you.